Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Tim Heinen's Vinyl, your friendly neighborhood vinyl guy. It is Halloween. Thank you, one and all, uh, for watching. We Hopefully, you had, end up having a good Halloween this year. Um, it's kind of crazy, wasn't it? I mean, you know, social distancing and all. We actually uh, set up a table so we could be distanced apart to uh, hand out candy and uh, had it all in little bags and stuff like that. And I kind of packed them up and, you know, it was masked and gloved when I did. So, um, and we also took uh, Oliver out for some trick-or-treating. Um, that was the the clip that you saw at the beginning. He was, he wanted to be as a jellyfish this year. So, wife did an awesome job on the costume. So, figured I'd share. Anyway, um, what I'm listening to tonight for this update one of the last record store day drop three releases for me to grab, which was Double Whammy. I know this has been shown a lot. I'm listening to it tonight uh, for the first time, and it's just absolutely killer stuff. Uh, Craft Recordings is really knocking these pressings out of the park. Um, you have uh, Count Five, you've got Circus Maximus, um, Poor Little Rich Kids, The Vagrants, The Bittersweets, just a great collection of garage rock in mono. So that's what I am playing tonight. So quick update. I think I've got four, if yeah, well, four or five. Um, and you probably saw from the title that one was a uh, huge mega score grail. So we'll get to that at the end. Cause you know, we believe in teasers here. I can't remember if I showed this, I might have. And if I did, I apologize, but this is what happens when you start to get old. You start to lose your memory. Uh, King Gizzard and Lizard Wizard, this is not going on Infinity. Um, so if I showed this, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. One of their better releases, in my opinion, this is a great entry point. Um, and then this is kind of in the wheelhouse where they uh, had little tricks that they were playing with everybody on the on the album. They're like little things. Um, like uh, one of the ones I have, it has a lock groove at the end, which is a perfect measure. So it sounds like it's just playing forever. Um, there's an album quarters, four songs. Each song is uh, the exact same time length. Um, so No Good On Infinity, nine songs. And um, all the songs go together. Like, they, it's continuous. And when track nine fades out, if you were to have this on CD and repeat, it fades in at the beginning of track one as if to almost sound like an infinite loop. So this is the 2020 reissue on really funky world splattered vinyl. So that's one side and then the other side is actually almost completely different. So sounds fantastic. Definitely was happy to add this one to the King Gizzard collection that is ever growing, but the way that they release albums was at like 53 a year. Um, still need a few, so. Uh, this one I had a while back. Um, Bill told me that this one was coming out, and uh, I kind of was a couple weeks behind on it. I didn't get it on the pre-order, so I got it a couple weeks later. Um, and how this one stayed shelved, I basically, is beyond me. It's, uh, pardon me, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers just cooling, or just cooling, excuse me, you gotta be... Dropping the E. I mean, just an incredible cast. You got Lee Morgan, Hank Mobley, Bobby Timmons, and uh, Jamie Merritt. How would you let that sit on a shelf? I think it was recorded in... Uh, late 50s, maybe? I don't remember. Oh, yeah, recorded 50, March 59. So how that sat for that long is beyond me. But... If you don't have it, it's a must. Another must that just got reissued. Um, I almost picked this one up until I saw the reissue was coming and then uh, decided to wait for that. And then I had to wait and wait and wait. Because for some reason, when you pre-order stuff at Amazon, um, it doesn't really mean you get first priority. Just, yeah, let's see whenever the hell you get it. That was a Giant Steps from John Coltrane. This is the 2LP Expanded Edition. Um, as opposed to the three LP expanded edition, which is out there as well. I actually have a CD of this one. Um, definitely had wanted to get this on vinyl. Um, so it has a bunch of, uh, 
alternate takes, and um, yeah, that's what that's what side two, or that's what LP two is, or just all alternate takes. But it sounds fantastic, and I love the fact that they did it on the replicated Atlantic label. Let's see if I can pull one of them out here. The old school Atlantic. My issue with this one, I'm gonna forward that. I'm not gonna forward that right now. My issue with that release was that it's two LP. Um, not that it was necessarily a premium price, but it wasn't like you know ten bucks. It was, you know, it, it, it was a few bucks, but no gatefold. I mean, I, I don't know why we're getting cheap with some of these two LP sets with no gatefold. Um, I would have much rather had a poly inner, which it didn't even give you that. Shame on you, Atlantic, for not even doing that. Um, considering you pressed it on quality vinyl, you didn't give a, a poly inner. I would have rather had the poly inner and a gatefold with some of the information on the gatefold and um, paid upwards of uh, like, you know, five or seven dollars more. Just would have made a better package. Just me ranting. The music is phenomenal. The pressing is great. So, um, no arguments there. So, uh, next one, didn't pick it up new, but I mean, it was in new-ish condition, it like it had been played once, um, and that's the, uh, this is the reissue of uh, Sam and Dave Solman. Not enough Sam and Dave in my collection, so I picked this one up a while back at an incredible price and uh, pounced on it quicker than I could blink. I think this one came from uh, Smart Punk, I believe. Um, and I, when I say a great price, I think it was like 12 bucks, so I couldn't have said no to that. I mean, you've got Soul Man, you've got Let Me Be Me, you've got um, I'm With You, Don't Knock It, Just Keep Holding On. Just a, just a ton of great music from two guys that couldn't stay at each other at all. So, what are you going to do? But, hey, when they were on stage, they did their thing, uh, they came to work, and uh, thank goodness for that. So, so now the grail. The one that literally made my heart skip a beat. Kind of like this. So yeah, something like that. So anyway, um, so I look at this, you know, just scouring on the uh, on the internet, you know, kind of like what we all do. We all just kill time looking at records, right? So I'm looking, and I run across this on eBay, and I'm like, price is too low. There's something wrong. And I'm looking, and I'm reading the descriptions, and it says there's a possibility of some damage. Um, so I look at the photos and I, I kind of like, all right, well, let me investigate a little further, you know, because if it's a scuff, you know, you see, you kind of see it's tough. It's like, if it's a scuff, it may not be so bad. If it's a feeler, it could be. So I, I messaged the seller and I said, Hey, is there any way to get better pictures of what you're trying to show? Um, just so I know what I'm getting myself into if I decide to do this. And, and they say, yes, yeah, sure. So um, I'm talking to a couple friends, and I'm like, hey, I'll show you guys the pictures and, and just kind of help me, you know, talk it, talk it through. So the pictures didn't really change that much of the view, but it did look more like a scuff um, and not something that was super feeler. And so I went ahead and did the bidding thing, and I won. And what I got this for was for less than half of what it averages go for on Discogs. So this is the Jimi Hendrix Experience box set from 2000. Um, this is actually a first press because the first presses have the velvety texture lid. So they did take some photos and as you can see, the back has got a little wear. 
Now, the issue was with the vinyl on one of the discs, it was stored out of the jacket. Why would you have such an expensive piece and mishandle it so poorly? I don't know. I didn't get into the logistics. When I got it in, I, I immediately went to the two. There were two discs. One looked worse than the other. And I, I went to them and said, okay, let's assess the damage. And one wasn't that bad. There were marks, but they were just they were obvious scuffs. So I was like, okay. So the other one, it w turned out to be a feeler. And I was very, very nervous. I did a quick clean of those two to give them a play test. I said, well, if they play through fine, we're good. And I think I got a couple of pops. Okay, not thrilled, but I can live with it. Especially considering it wasn't in the music. It was in kind of the transition. Like, wasn't necessarily in the dead wax because it was a point where Jimmy was talking, but that's a live track, but the music was over. So I was like, okay. So I ended up cleaning, doing all of them on a very deep clean. The box actually had a little bit of a smell to it. So I left it open for a few days. I, um, this, w whenever they package stuff from the experienced Hendrix family, they always do them in inner, in uh, poly inners. I actually tossed those poly inners, um, being his, that, um, the, set itself was not cared for properly i didn't trust them so i put them in essentially brand new mofi sleeves so they come in a very thin i mean this is you could say it's an lp jacket but it's very thin comparatively speaking and as you can see like i said i put it in its own new mofi sleeve like i said i did a very serious thorough deep cleaning on all of them um, a fair amount of dirt came out. So, um, and then I spun it and it sounds really good. So this, like I said, this came out in 2000. Um, for those of you who don't know the timeline of the Hendrix legacy stuff. So after, obviously after he died, um, if you are familiar with Hendrix's um, catalog disputes. Alan Douglas was brought in to kind of oversee and produce um, some of these tapes that were discovered of Hendrix. Uh, things that were to be supposed, well, like saved supposedly for the next album, First Rays of the New Rising Sun, which he had already communicated that he had the name for. Um, some things were just ideas and thoughts. So he produced the first two, uh, well, well I should say Midnight, Midnight, Light, Midnight Lightning and Crash Landing. And what makes those so kind of controversial is that he brought in session musicians, um, even to the point where, um, he, uh, you know, used things that just weren't necessarily up to snuff so there was concern about his handling of that um this was disc eight disc eight was one of the two that wasn't in the greatest of condition i would have said vg i would have said by the time i got the disc six which the sleeve i mean i wiped all these down but it actually had something on it this was the one that was in the worst condition this disc, disc six disc six um I would have put it at a VG minus. I've got it up to a VG, VG plus, um, because I didn't hear the pop this time. So, um, but it is visually, so I'd probably say that VG, everything else is VG plus. So, um, so anyway, back to, so, um, Alan Douglas ended up catching a lot of, of flack for that. There were some other decisions he made, like when they reissued them on CD after a while with, when they first came out on CD, they were originally pre originally presented in their original forms. Um, and then once MCA took over the, the label control um, with, with Alan Douglas, 
Alan Douglas thought it would be a smart idea to re-release Are You Experienced, Access Bottles Love and Electric Lady Land with different artwork, which was met with hardly any positive view. So I can't necessarily say that Alan Douglas is a bad person or what have you, because he, I mean, he was a, a jazz, he produced a lot of jazz. He, um, he was very business savvy in some in some things. Um, he also helped get the Last Prophets out, which was considered one of the first rap records. But obviously, there was a lot of concern with his handling of the Hendrix Library. So, in 1997, the family, after a long legal dispute, regained control uh, of the of the Hendrix catalog, and it was by the founding. Or it was founded on that Alan Douglas had taken kind of an advantage of Al, of Al Hendricks, Hendr uh, Jimmy's dad, by giving him a lowball offer because he knew that he needed cash really badly. He was um, not in good health, I believe, and I believe that there was some, he definitely did not have a lot of money. Um, and I don't think Hendricks really left him anything. Well, then again, he was 27, he probably not even had much of a will. Um, so he kind of, was in desperate need. So, considered unfair, anyway, family gets control back of basically the legacy. And that was when you started to see things like this. So this is, like I said, 2000, three years after they got control. And what, what, what started to happen was people who had tapes were finally coming forward. Because anything at that point, if it was found with Hendrix, would have gone to Alan Douglas's control. And some people felt that he shouldn't have had control or wasn't doing the right thing. So that's why you started to see a lot of these things creep up. And to this day, um, you know, it was like, oh no, we have Hendrix recorded here, but we can't find any tapes. And then a year after the family gets control, oh, we magically found it. So, I mean, say what you will, but it's it's good that we still have these these legacy things. So it's a lot of at the time, um, previously unreleased uh, takes, um, a compilation of some live things that were uh, later used in other things, um, but it's just a wonderful set to have. They've since reissued the CD with even some extra verses that time, um, but this vinyl set never got a reissue to my knowledge, and it's very hard to track down. And like I said, even in the um, velvety cover. These things go 100 well over. So, you know, I, it was considered a grail for me just because it wasn't accessible. You know, I mean, there are some grails that I can get. Like, here's the booklet that comes with it. it talks about all the different demo tracks and stuff like that or, or alternate takes. Um, some things I can get. I've had my hands on the nude cover electric lady land a couple times. Just didn't have the money. Um, I've never seen this. I've never seen this one out in the wild. So, um, or if I had, it's definitely not the velvet pressing. So I was very, very fortunate. So now, as far as for box sets go that I am aware of, as far as for official, I'm still needing uh, West Coast Seattle Boy and Wonderland. Wonderland is insanely priced so i don't know if i'll ever own that one oh well, never say never right but but that was that was my grail that was my big haul and a very nice surprise that i was able to make that one work so um that's pretty much it for this one um i've got a lot of stuff that i'm still listening to i've got a lot of stuff that i'm still cleaning i've got a lot of stuff to show but I am going to try to break it up. Now, this one went a little longer because, granted, it was only five albums, but let's face it, it's Hendrix. I'm going to talk. That's what I do. So, uh, thank you for watching. Hopefully, everybody had a wonderful, happy, and safe Halloween. Um, so, now let's, uh, let's get through the rest of the year, right? November's tomorrow. Please go out and vote, and uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Love you all. Peace.